Good morning, everyone. Before we start this seminar, uh, on the passing of senior advocate and eminent jurist, Tafali Nariman, we'd like to pay a short tribute to him. I'd like to invite Mr. Vipul Mudgal, Director of Common Cause, to please pay that tribute. I've been asked to represent the civil society because there are lots of lawyers who speak from personal experience and who talk about Ali Nariman, his times, and who've seen him in the courtroom. But I've seen him only as a civil society activist, and I don't have any personal experience, I must say. So I don't have any personal insights to offer. Dignitaries on the dais would definitely know much more than all of you. So, I can say that the civil society, generations of civil society before me and after me have deeply respected him for, for, for what he was, for what he stood for. At one uh, meeting he said, uh, this was uh, a memorial meeting of somebody, that he was a good man. And you know what good men do, do good things. And I thought, uh, Nariman was a good man and he did good things and that is why civil society remembers him. He was, as, a, as an author, for instance, I mean, his books, which were not law books, will be very soon classics of legal text because he was a good man, because he, uh, he, he did things, he, he represented values which we all believe in. So, uh, as, an, as an author, He's, he's a chronicler of our times, as as a as a, as a uh, you know public spirited citizen. That comes much before being a lawyer and being a jurist. So civil society will always remember him as someone who took up vital public causes, and he fought, fought for constitutional values and human dignity. And by civil society, I don't mean a narrow kind of definition of NGOs or charitable organizations, but I mean civil society in a broad, pluralistic kind of sense, where all types of citizen groups, associations, and diverse voices of victims, vulnerable sections come together. I remember in, in my organization, Common Cause, approached him a couple of times. He never succeeded, but we discussed cases with him. We sat with him. He gave us insights. But the other organization I represent, Association for Democratic Reforms, succeeded in getting him. Kamuniji is here, she would remember better than me. But at least in one case, uh, where, uh, you see, uh, uh, it was challenged uh, that uh, 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 first uh, ADR went to court saying that all candidates in all elections should be required to do the following declare their assets, declare their education qualifications. Now, these are very important things, and all of you know why. Their education qualifications and uh, the assets of their family members and, and their qualifications, etc. So, uh, parliament got together, and, and the criminal background, how can I forget that? You know, that, that was actually the main point. There, the, the, the criminal records going on. So. Uh, parliament got together, and uh, no apologies to anybody, any other political party, opposition and ruling party got together, and they uh, they passed the legislation saying that yes, they should be declaring their assets and their criminal records and their education qualifications, but it will be voluntary; it will not be compulsory. So, common uh, sorry, uh, ADR went to the court again, Supreme Court, and said that you know, this is unconstitutional. And in that case, uh, we thought, uh, I mean, I, I was not there, but Tilochan uh, Shastri and uh, uh, I think Aminvi was also there and uh, 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 Mr. Jagdeep Snoker, they contacted Mr. Nariman and he was in Mauritius at some place. And I mean, he took the call, a 
a lot of i know today's lawyers except with the exception of prashant bhushan do not even take calls from civil society unless you know it it matters to them in a kind of narrow sense so he took the call and he said oh this is very important why don't you go to my office and talk to um, sharma my assistant and i'll come back on such and such date and i'll take it up so he did that and then in many cases uh, mr nariman extensively used adr data now today everybody uses adr data and i know even in 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 this electoral bond case adr data has been used by 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 court i think in the uh, early 2000s it, you know he he used uh, adr data extensively and he believed in it and he encouraged us and also in lily thomas case again he he very extensively he used adr data community in that and uh, 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 you know uh, he uh, he went to we, we did not have the courage to ask him how much he charges because i mean he obviously he, he took up all these cases pro bono for us so we in civil society see him as a defender of democracy as a strong voice of reason and we also know that as civil society look everybody thinks that we will fight of course we are fighting electoral bond case we are fighting whole lot of other cases which are which which are in court but civil society is also extremely vulnerable you know when civil rights are suspended when something like that happens it's civil society which faces the onslaught which is under attack first before anybody else and it is at times like this that you look up to people who can speak truth to power and this is where nariman when he resigned as additional solicitor general of india in 1975 now these are things that good men do you know which which people with some courage and conviction can do and when he resigned i am told in fact i did not know this but kumi kapoor has written in her obituary that he resigned within hours of the proclamation of the internal emergency by mrs indira gandhi i mean salute to him that somebody who could he did not wait for others to do it you know he did it so uh, i mean and, and this for reasons like this that the civil society looked up to him i mean he took up various cases for uh, various organizations we followed him we followed his cases particularly when he was taking up the case of the rohingya because there was nobody taking up this case i mean with the exception again of kisan bhushan and and perhaps uh, colin gonzalez uh, but uh, nariman i mean fought it with conviction he said articles 21 14 even 32 did not apply only to citizens of india they applied to a person to to everybody and i mean he he said this complete nonsense i mean he dismissed and he said in fact he challenged the government he challenged the, uh, the, the union of india saying that these uh, you know the sick and the infirm and 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 these children and these women they cannot be labeled as terrorists like this is complete nonsense so uh, i mean we we that that is how we followed Uh, Fali Nariman, and as civil society, we we believe that uh, you know he was somebody we would uh, you know as as civil society we can we can we can whenever we need it. I must say, in the fail in my duty as a civil society representative, if I do not mention some contentious cases which took up. Somebody wrote to me yesterday only that he took up the case of Coca Cola. when the civil society in that particular part of india was up in arms against their unbridled water extraction or whatever else he took up union carbide in india's worst industrial disaster bopar gas tragedy and also he was the lawyer of gujarat government against the narmada bachao andolan but it must be said once again i mean i i keep on coming back to the point that good men good do good things that he he had the courage to apologize to say that it was wrong actually i should not have taken up the uh, union carbide case and i think and he said it in unqualified terms and several times and i think he's also said it in his 
autobiography, which is which is so important, and that is why it will be a classic text, you know. And I think uh, uh, the lawyers of today, I'm not one. I, I I do because of working with common cause, I work with a lot of lawyers, but I'm not one of them. They they don't apologize for things the, normally. I mean, I, I I don't see them do that. So I mean, that also shows the character of a person. In the end, let me say, and also in Narmada Bachao Andolan, he actually abruptly dumped his client, Gujarat government, and he and, and he said when they did nothing to to stop the kind of torture and uh, attack at, attack on churches and on Christian community in Gujarat. So, I mean, it, it, it is these things which, in spite of the fact that as a lawyer you took up many cases, but you stood up for values that you believed in. So in the end, I would say that he has went and he's been quoted extensively on this particular thing, that he has lived and flourished in a secular India, and he would like to die in a secular India. So this last wish of his was fulfilled. He actually died in, a, in an India which can still be called secular. So uh, it, it, it is very important. Let me say on behalf of civil society that Mr. Nariman's constitutionalism, his secularism, and his commitment to ethics are vital for us because one cannot think about protecting the vulnerable groups like the sexual and other minorities and many other victims without these values which Mr. Nariman defended throughout his long professional life. Thank you. Thank you, Vipul. Honorable judges, senior advocates on the panel, Alok, and friends, I welcome you again to this seminar. At the seminar today, we will discuss two important issues. The Supreme Court's Judicial Administration and Management, which is session one, and the morning half. And session two will focus on the Supreme Court's recent trend on cases involving civil liberties and political rights. I'd like to introduce the first session and some of the issues that we are expecting to have a more detailed discussion on today. The Supreme Court's judicial administration has raised concerns, especially with regard to the opacity and lack of accountability in the administration and management of the court. There have been many concerns. One, the selective and delayed or non-listing of certain cases, despite judicial orders to the contrary. Two, the open court public system of mentioning urgent fresh cases, giving way to a closed door email-based system or application system with no response mechanism and therefore no accountability, leaving the absolute discretion with the Chief Justice. And three, the non-compliance with rules and procedures and departure from long-standing conventions on allocation of benches, especially in certain critical matters. The issues and problems of allocation of cases to benches by the Chief Justice of India, who is regarded as the master of roster, was underlined in a press conference in 2018. And we are privileged today to have with us two of the four judges who addressed that press conference, Justice Lokur and Justice Korean Joseph. In that unprecedented conference, the judges had complained that the then Chief Justice was misusing his powers as the master of roster in allocation of critical cases, which had put democracy itself in danger. Six years on, and several Chief Justices later, the perceived concerns remain, and there has been little movement on the part of the court as an institution to address these. The problem is not limited to the perceived allocation of cases to benches selectively. It also extends to the listing of cases which we feel is a far more crucial function exercised by the Chief Justice. 
Thus, the decision as to which cases are to be listed or not listed sometimes becomes more critical than the benches before whom they are listed. The Supreme Court rules are absolutely silent on the powers of the master of roster, as the Chief Justice is called, nor do they provide for any well-defined, transparent, and fair procedure or method for the constitution of benches and for listing of cases before such benches. Thus, the power exercised by the Chief Justice as master of roster is not statutory in nature, but it is merely an executive power of the Chief Justice as the head of the institution as a matter of convention. This being the position, the executive power of the Chief Justice is coupled with the duty to ensure that fundamental principles of fair play in the administration of justice are scrupulously observed. To deliberate on some of these issues, we have today a very esteemed panel. But let me first invite and welcome Mr. Alok Prasanna Kumar as the moderator of session one. Alok is the co-founder of the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy based in Bengaluru. He is a regular columnist with the Economic and Political Weekly and the Deccan Herald, writing about issues of law, society, and the constitution, and a member of the working group of the Campaign for Judicial Accountability. Alok. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege on the behalf of CJR to welcome you all to this event. And uh, as Cheryl mentioned, I'll be moderating the first session. Uh, this particular session, as has already been described, focuses on something which I would like to say personally, I never encountered as a law student being taught constitutional law or being taught anything about our courts. The whole concept of the master of the roster is something I vaguely came across when I practiced in the Supreme Court for about four and a half years. But I think the events of the last decade or so have shown us is in fact fundamental and key to the way in which the Supreme Court functions and not just the Supreme Court, every high court in this country as well. And what we are trying to discuss here is something relates to the, that relates to what goes on behind the scenes in an institution, which is just as important as what happens in front, which is what is visible to the public. And I think our ideas and understanding of how the judiciary works, what is constitutional law and so on, should be informed by both of these things. What happens behind the scenes and how does it impact what we see as judgments, as orders, as you know, pronouncements of the court. So without any further delay, uh, I will very briefly introduce our first speaker on the panel, uh, Justice Kurian Joseph. He is a former judge of the Supreme Court of India. No, 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 sir, because since you have to leave, I was just going to mention that I was going to invite you. Um, a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, and he has served as the Chief Justice of the Himachal Pradesh High Court. He is known for his humane and compassionate approach to law and justice, and as Cheryl has mentioned, somebody who did uh, take the bold decision to go out there in the public in 2018 to speak about the issues of the master of the roster. Uh, I'd like to now invite Justice Joseph to give us his remarks. Thank you, Alok, uh, for this um, accommodation. And I must especially thank uh, Brother Justice Lokur also um, for giving me this uh, precedence. You should have spoken first. I had mentioned to Prasant that uh, I had a commitment at 11, so I may have to go at 11. But I would definitely would like to listen to uh, Justice Madan also um, before I go. So straight to the uh, topic, um, both of us were also um, chief justices in the high courts. Sister Anjana is also there, Sister Anjana is also there. So um, all of us know how the high courts function. 
under Article 229, um, the Chief Justice is the supreme as far as uh, the High Court is concerned. Then also, the High Court functions uh, through committees. The most important committee is the Administrative Committee. Then comes various other committees. But I do not find such a system of functioning of the Supreme Court, though we have a, a few committees, I don't think the, the, the Supreme Court actually functions through its committees. Why I mention this at the outset is because uh, Supreme Court is always guard, regarded, considered, and conceived as the guardian of the Constitution of India, the High Courts. As the given this name, Chief Justice of India, is not unlike the High Courts, the High Court Justice of the High Court of a particular state. But uh, coming to, in fact, I went through the Constitutional Assembly debate source on this karta. Though he takes, that's very interesting, he takes oath, his appointment is such Chief Justice of India, I've seen the warrants. But uh, coming to the oath and the th uh, third schedule, oath is as a Chief Justice, when I made an outright robust um, observation that this is a judicial indiscipline, where a two-judge bench uh, declining to follow a three-judge bench. And then a judge who is the two judge, makes an observation, goes to the three, and presides of the five. I don't know how this uh, system works. What is the special interest of a judge in a case? Because a judge, when he takes oath, his oath is different even from the oath of the President of India. The judge's oath is he will uphold the Constitution and the laws. He's not upholding anything else. I've seen judges uh, speaking. I've done my best according to my conscience. He has no special conscience, individual conscience. His conscience is only the constitutional conscience. He does not have a, a, a conscience formed either by his ideology or by his philosophy or by the commitment of the patrons who have uh, helped him to reach that position. His conscience is the conscience of the Constitution. He's the conscience keeper of the Constitution. Therefore, whatever he does, he does only to uphold the Constitution. Well, when we had that press conference, uh, which we have not discussed so far. I don't think that anybody has uh, told thereafter also. We had a series of meetings uh, thereafter. At least for two weeks, those meetings continued. And those meetings were of um, all the incoming chief justices with these uh, four of us. And there was one suggestion that uh, the master of roster exercise should be appropriately regulated, not controlled, appropriately regulated in order to avoid a perceived arbitrariness. I refuse to believe that any Chief Justice is arbitrary. But there is a perception, and nobody can blame for that perception also. The first main observation I made after my retirement also is that there is a perception of a remote control in the Supreme Court. So there is a perception in the minds of the public that the master of roster business is not uh, handled the way it should be handled. So the general discussion was that there could be some regulation that at least the first three could be a, the master of roster committee. I'm aware that there was a PIL filed by our uh, renowned Mr. Shandibushan for five. But five may be a little difficult, according to me, at least the first three. 
and i'm sure of the first three at least one would be an incumbent for the next uh, uh, coming post of um, mm. incoming chief justice the first three if three of them could uh, sit and then take a call on the listing of cases on the constitution of the quorum on the subject allocation to judges and in a given situation what to do when a judge recuses these are the four situations the master of roster has to handle uh, an issue sensitively though it is now become sensational it is sensational because its constitutional sensitivity is not actually considered the way it should have been considered because there is a perception and you can blame the people for having that perception because that is what is actually heard even from inside though we went outside and spoke there is a new trend of people inside and talking at least but i don't know all these things are going to whether they are being listened to they are going to tap ears i believe so my first suggestion on that master of roster business is that you know the it should be done at least by year 3 and on the constitution of uh, the benches particularly very important constitutional matters the diversity should be reflected regional gender at least these two should be reflected in constituting the benches it should not be left to a person to select four five people four five judges i'm sorry four five judges and constitute a bench as i told the beginning it's not very difficult to 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 get a decision if you know the mindset of a judge though there's a presumption that the judge doesn't have uh, a particular mindset the judge has only a constitutional mindset because the judge exercises his duties without fear favor affection or ill will on the lighter side is that perception correct now just i'm asking i'm talking to a few lawyers they were just quibbling something in supreme court is a well known uh, thing that you know the advocates and record no they will not choose a senior till they know of the constitution of the bench after seeing the constitution they will they will go for an appropriate senior for the bench that's known to everybody but now the trend is not that now the trend is if the case is posted before a bench people are able to predict what the result is or the outcome is that has become the the shift in the trend now so people don't mind uh, people don't uh, in fact spend money in spend in, in and getting seniors because result is uh, fairly well known if it is before a bench this is the result on b subject this is very this is actually the perception people have i'm not speaking uh, my what you call considered view but i am saying the per- i am only airing the perception of the people of the stakeholders who are mainly the lawyers practicing in the supreme court because uh, since we continue in our uh, uh, our own way as arbitrators and um, mediators and uh, consultants a lot of lawyers uh, appear before us and uh, they also share some of their concerns so this is uh, my two uh, these are my two considered suggestions just coming with that i would also would like to add because this is a very important occasion though it's not the audience that matters but this program that matters you know the in all other high courts and the national institutions the motto is satya meva jayate but our supreme court has a different motto our supreme court's motto is yado dharma stado jaya i don't know why that different motto is adopted by the supreme court of india because to me for the supreme court the guardian of the constitution truth is the constitution dharma 
is not always the truth. Dharma is discharge of your duty in terms of the need of the hour. That is Dharma as popularly understood. So I would request the Chief Justice of India and uh, the well-meaning companions with him and also the public to think about this issue as to why the Supreme Court should have a, a different motto, different from the national motto, because that makes a lot of difference in its approach. On the subject in the afternoon, which uh, unfortunately I'm not able to participate, there is also a perception that um, the constitutional courts forget about the second part of Article 21. They think and interpret Article 21 only as a right to life and forget the best, the rest part of it, which is the best part of it, and personal liberty. And what is life without liberty? Why should there be life without liberty? If you are taking away the liberty part of a person, there's no point in giving him the, the life part of uh, his life. So I think I am of the strong view that you know our constitutional courts should uh, keep in mind this Article 21 should be understood giving equal importance to both aspects of life and liberty. But the perception now is that life is of course guarded but liberty is uh, ignored. And uh, finally, on the whistleblowers aspect also, um, we are not able to find many whistleblowers. We were uh, not just spending five minutes before um, <clears throat> the conference on the tea. We discussed quite a few things. But all those things which we discussed, do we read in any media? Do we see in any electronic media? except a couple of uh, um, private media uh, in the digital side, we don't find any fearless, truthful version of the facts coming out. The greatest blow to democracy is that the fourth pillar has failed the country. Forget about the first three pillars. Fourth pillar is the media they have failed to defend democracy. They have failed to defend the constitution. They have failed to defend the truth. So our only hope is the fifth pillar, whistleblowers. Somehow, they are also not able to blow. Maybe post-COVID lungs uh, have been affected. The way the lungs are crushed in the country today so that nobody will blow the whistle is a very dangerous trend for the country. So we need to support, we need to stand up, we need to speak out, we need to stay alert and we need to stay with at least those few of the whistleblowers who are left in the country, who are the only hope as I see it. Thank you. All the best. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think those enlightening remarks uh, have given a good start to our session. And I'd like to pick on one point that uh, Justice Joseph has mentioned, which I think is very important to keep in mind that the judiciary is that part of the government which does not have, as you would have heard, the power of the sword or the power of the purse. They don't control the money, they don't control the police, but their ability to retain legitimacy, to do what they do, lies in the public's perception that the judiciary is fair, the judiciary acts in a manner in accordance with law and upholds the law. 
and it is the public's perception which is the source of the judiciary's strength. The judiciary may draw its powers from the constitution, but to be able to exercise those powers in a manner that, you know, actually further the constitution, the judiciary has to create this perception that we are the ones who are fair, we are above partisan politics, we are, about, uh, we are above smaller considerations, we are the ones who can actually defend the constitution. And on that note, uh, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Justice Madan Lokur, who's a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, and he has served as the Chief Justice of the Andhra Pradesh and Gauhati High Courts. And uh, he has been outspoken about the functioning of the Supreme Court, and he's also currently a uh, judge of the Supreme Court of Fiji. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Alok. <coughs> Good morning to everybody. You know, I'd just like to share a few thoughts about uh, the process of uh, listing, uh, which is the subject of uh, today's discussion of the, in this uh, particular session. You know, the problem of uh, listing of cases is not something new. Uh, it's been there for a very, very long time, uh, particularly in the Supreme Court. But today we are talking about it, and I'm glad we're talking about it because the stakes today are much higher than Uh, we used to have something called, which we as <laughs> advocates called, a fish market system. What used to happen was that uh, one day in a week, you know, all of us uh, would sit in the court of the Chief Justice and somebody from the registry would come and say that, well, you know, anybody wants to have their case listed on 15th of January, please raise your hand and then, you know, you'd raise your hand and say, yeah, I'm my case. You know, so th this used to go on every week. I think Kamini will probably remember, Rekha also might. Settlement, <laughs> yeah. huh? Settlement yeah. But we used to call it fish market because <laughs> everybody was trying to get that date. Now, the reason was, uh, at that point of time, of course, the uh, communication systems were not very good. Telephones were not very good. So you had to send a letter to somebody in case they wanted to come or they wanted to engage a senior advocate and so on. Uh, but there were reasons for that uh, uh, system, which used to be called, as uh, Rekha says politely, the settlement system, but uh, which we used to call fish market. But anyway, then I remember sometime, uh, I think probably it was uh, Chief Justice Bhaguti, he introduced the system of a listing pro forma. Now, there were two very important things in that listing pro forma. Of course, you had to give the parties names and so on. But there were two very important things. One was you had to give the quorum of the judges of the court that last heard the case. So while fi filling the listing pro forma for listing the case, you would say that it was last listed before Justice A and Justice B. The second important thing was what is the question of law that is involved and if there is any other similar matter. So if there is already a similar matter, then the registry would put it before the bench which was dealing with that similar matter. The purpose of that quorum to say that it is it was listed before Justice A and Justice B is that the matter would go before that bench. It would not go before a different bench because that bench had dealt with the uh, case. And in case the senior judge, Justice A, had retired by then, or was not available for some reason, which was, which normally didn't happen, but uh, retirement, yes. Then it would go before a bench in which Justice B was there, you know, so that continuity would be there. So I think that was very, very important. Now that, I'm afraid, is not happening now. You know, the bench may change. There would be Justice A and Justice B, and the next time the case might be listed before Justice C and Justice D which is something which did not happen when the listing pro forma system was there. But at all points of time, you know, the Chief Justice had some control over the listing of cases. I will come to that in a minute. 
uh, we also had you know issues of uh, some judges uh, who were known in the bar as pro tenant judges for example so there would be a you know uh, the lawyers would somehow they had try and have their case listed before that particular judge if they were representing the tenant we had judges who were known to be pro labor so if there was a case of a workman or the case of uh, some employee um, lawyers would try to have the cases listed before that particular judge so you know these things were happening it's not as if it is something that has happened only today these things were happening but they were not talked about why because you trusted the judges to give a decision in accordance with law right their bias inherited bias pro tenant bias or pro labor bias or pro this bias or pro that bias would be there but you would still you know probably be satisfied with the decision there would not be so much of discussion about all this uh, the first time that i remember uh that something like this happened where you know benches were fixed by the chief justice uh, as the master of the roster i did not know it at that time i was a lawyer at that time it was in 1984 85 but this was disclosed by justice uh, rajinder sachar uh, who was at that time the senior most judge in the delhi high court in 1984 in delhi we had this uh, you know horrible uh, uh, anti sikh riots after the assassination of the prime minister and uh, <coughs> rioters were, you know going around uh, killing uh, sikhs hunting them out and killing them and this matter came up as a public interest litigation uh, in the delhi high court during the course of hearing Uh, justice such a rights uh, in his autobiography during the course of hearing it appeared that the uh, uh, justice such a who was a you know great civil rights activist also uh, was taking a particular view which was not helpful to the government because the government apparently did not act uh, well in time to prevent those rights uh, or to quell them and uh, this was sometime in december after the court vacations were over in uh, in december in january justice sachar found that the case had been taken away from his board and had been listed before the court of the chief justice he was surprised he took it up uh, with the chief justice but nothing happened that was i think perhaps uh, as far as far as i know And the first documented case of the chief justice exercising the power of the master of the roster to list a case before a particular bench or to take it out of a particular bench so that an order which the chief justice did not want was uh, you know uh, could not be passed so these are instances you know where this thing has been happening now uh, i do remember that uh, when i was in charge of uh, the uh, computer committee in the delhi high court uh, we had this problem of you know similar cases going before some other bench we did not have a listing performance system which we introduced uh, later but uh, you know th- uh, in uh, a case where there were say about 6 or 7 accused persons and somebody applied for bail it would go before bench a and in the same case if somebody applied for bail accused number 2 applied for bail it would go before some other bench accused number 3 applied for bail it would probably go to a third bench depending upon the number of benches dealing with uh, uh, you know that particular uh, roster that is the criminal roster so we introduced in the form of a listing pro forma through the computer that you give the fir number because the fir number is the one that is important which will identify all those 6 or 7 accused so the computer will pick up the fir number and say that well you know this fir number has been dealt with by court number 5 so all cases pertaining to this uh, fir number will go to court number 5 that was one manner in which the discretion of the chief justice as the master of the roster 
the chief justice did not interfere in saying that no no this particular case will go here this particular case will go there it was being done by the registry but that discretion that the registry had it is not that the registry was biased or anything but that you know it would just create complications if similar cases are going before different benches you might get different orders and uh, that would of course uh, you know cause uh, heartburn among some of the litigants so through this system of uh, you know computers we were able to bring about some semblance of uh, sanity in the listing of cases the computer people told me that there is a reason for having a computer override which is the exercise of the power of the roster uh, master of the roster by the chief justice why does the chief justice need that power of override there would be instances and i remember one particular case where again it was a very sensitive uh, matter a criminal case um, which had been decided by the district court by the district judge and an appeal was <coughs> bound to be filed as a matter of uh, right and the bench dealing with that particular roster the criminal bench one of the judges did not want to hear the case for whatever reason i don't know the reason but one of the judges did not want to hear the case and sent a letter actually uh, to the uh, registry saying that if an appeal is filed in this particular case do not list it before me that's where the override of the computer system <coughs> comes in so then the chief justice will say well you know normally as per the computer the matter should go before this particular bench this bench doesn't want to hear it or the senior judge doesn't want to hear it so it should go before uh, some other bench now that power to override can be misused and if you have a sensitive case even in uh, the high courts if you have a sensitive case and the uh, registry brings it to the notice of the chief justice or the chief justice comes to know about it the chief justice can override the computer use his power as the master of the roster and list the case wherever he desires like it happened in the case of uh, uh, justice satcher what happened in the supreme court now in the supreme court uh, when i was in uh, charge of the e committee i wanted to introduce this system where the listing of cases could be done by the computer because in the supreme court there was no rigid uh, you know roster like you had in the high courts so before the start of the session in january for example or in july i can tell you about delhi high court the roster would come out you know the day before on the last working day the roster would come out that from next uh, session onwards justice a and b will be presiding over a division bench which will be dealing with criminal cases c and d will be decide will be presiding over a division bench dealing with uh, you know public interest litigation or with revenue matters or with some other kind of cases so there you know the list is available and that is prepared by the chief justice in exercise of uh, uh, the uh, master of the roster power that system does not exist in the supreme court okay there could be occasions when criminal cases are listed before any bench and uh, that has happened on many occasions so at that time uh, i remember this was sometime in perhaps in 2014 or 15 when a decision was taken to try and uh, introduce the computerization of listing the registry told me that listen we cannot computerize listing why because there are as many at that time there are as many as 36 instructions that have been given from chief justices from time to time on how to list cases so the power of the master of the roster was being exercised even at that point of time 2014 15 and certainly earlier because the chief justices had given uh, these directions much earlier now it, somebody somebody has to take a decision on listing cases somebody has to dis- take a dis- uh, decision on deciding what is the roster going to be one way of doing it is that you delegate that power or you keep that power as the chief justice 
The other way of doing it is that you delegate it to the computer. I don't see why, in spite of those 36 uh, instructions, the computer cannot do the listing of cases. Once you hand it over to the computer, the question of arbitrariness and so on will not arise. But that is not being done. And the result is, and that is one of the problems that uh, we faced, Justice Kurian and myself and uh, others, was that selectively cases were going before a particular bench. Cases which, you know, were uh, sensitive, so to speak, were going before a particular bench. And as luck would have it that the presiding judge in that uh, bench was not a particularly senior judge. I think he was at that time number 10 or number 12. So starting from the Chief Justice to at least number 9 or number 11, senior most judges were being overlooked for listing of these sensitive cases. Why is that happening? That is the question. And has there been a change since then? That is the question I think that we need to ask ourselves now. Today, we are discussing this because there are two issues that arise. One is, when is the case to be listed? So you would have a situation where somebody, a journalist, wants bail. The case is listed the same day, maybe in the evening. Somebody has been granted bail. The uh, prosecution says, no, the grant of bail by the High Court is wrong. So a special bench sits on a Saturday and stays that order, which is very, very unusual. But anyway, it stays that order so that this person cannot come out of jail. I am referring to the cases of Arnab Goswami and uh, Sai Baba. Why should that happen? So the timing of the listing of the case is very, very important in some instances. We've had issues pertaining to demonetization, listed I think after about four or five years. We've had issues relating to the electoral bonds listed after five years. Now it's whatever decision has come. Uh, I, I don't know how effective it will be in terms of stopping this uh, process. But in spite of directions given by the Supreme Court to say that this is an important case, it should be heard early, we are not granting any interim relief, the matter doesn't get listed for several years. You had the problem of uh, Article 370 of the Constitution not being listed for several years. You've had uh, one of the um, uh, cases that has been mentioned is that of uh, Umar Khalid asking for bail, not listed for a long time, I think more than two years or so, 13 adjournments. Ultimately, the lawyer said we want to withdraw the case. Why? Because as Justice uh, Korean Joseph mentioned, they knew what the result is going to be. And they knew what the result is going to be because it was apparently listed before a particular bench. And they knew what the uh, fate of that case is going to be. So these are issues, you know, which are live and which are affecting the quality of justice. And that is why there is this perception going around that, listen, there is something wrong, you know. Somebody has the power to do something. Why is that power not being exercised in a fair manner, in a reasonable manner, and in a just manner? These are questions that arise. One is, like I mentioned, about uh, the uh, timing of uh, the listing. When should it be listed? The other very serious problem is where should it be listed? Now, I'm talking, I, I go back now to 2018. Why should the cases be listed before a particular bench overlooking a large number of other benches? Is there any particular reason for doing that? And if there is a reason, shouldn't people know about it? All right. Is that power being exercised in a fair manner? Is it being exercised in a reasonable manner? Today, again, the perception is, and 
as I had adverted to in the case of uh, Omar Khalid. Today, again, the perception is that, well, you know, if a case goes before a particular bench, and some of the judges have retired, by the way, it's not, I'm not talking only about uh, judges who are here, this is going to be the result. And then the attempt of the lawyer also is to try and delay the listing of the case, because the lawyer knows that this is going to be the result. We've had instances where, again, uh, you know, uh, matters of uh, liberty, which was also adverted to Article 21 of the Constitution, you know exactly that this is what is going to happen in that case. The, the possibility of getting bail is distant, number one. Number two, while denying bail, some observations may be made by the court in the judgment which will make it difficult for persons similarly placed to get bail in the future. You've had instances of that under the UA UAPA, where it is almost impossible now to get a bail, to get bail. You've had instances of that under the PMLA, where also it is virtually impossible to get bail. This is quite different from the timing of the listing. This is again, you know, the, the result of a decision rendered by particular benches. So these are two, you know, very, very important areas where I think we must discuss and see how to get over them and to make sure that when, whenever a case is filed, it should be listed as soon as possible. I'm told today, uh, maybe the lawyers on this panel will be able to say that, uh, uh, you know, mentioning of cases has now stopped. You know, that is something that was a regular feature, you know. There would be complaints. I remember the complaints were placed uh, before me where a lawyer would say that, you know, in this case was shown in the weekly list, it has suddenly disappeared from the weekly list. Uh, can you just uh, ensure that it is listed? And I would tell my court master, find out what is the problem and have the case listed. But this frequency of errors, so to speak, I don't know whether they're errors or not, but this frequency of errors has increased. And that is why there is this perception going around that there is something amiss. What is the solution? Well, one solution, of course, is, <coughs> is to discuss uh, these kind of issues and uh, pass on the message so that uh, you know corrective steps are taken. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, another solution. And I'm very afraid of that solution, but I must <laughs> mention it uh, before you. And the reason why I'm afraid is uh, because of the provision in the Constitution, Article 145 of the Constitution, which enables Parliament to make a law dealing with several aspects about the functioning of the Supreme Court. I had just pointed it out to uh, Justice uh, Kurian. Article 145 says, subject to law made by Parliament, the Supreme Court may make rules with the approval of the, uh, subject to the approval of the President. What if Parliament makes a law and says, this is how the Supreme Court is supposed to function? We've had that example very recently in the appointment of election commissioners. The provision said, subject to law made by Parliament. The Supreme Court gave a direction that when you are appointing or selecting uh, election commissioners, have a collegium with the Chief Justice of India in it. What did Parliament do? They removed the Chief Justice from that uh, collegium and included a cabinet minister. That, that's one of the problems, but they included a cabinet minister. So law making, you know, is a solution, but that is, like I said, a very, very fearsome and a fearful uh, sort of a solution that is available under the Constitution. Before that happens, I think we need to get our act together and ensure that there is this uh, justice in listing, both in times of, uh, bo both in terms of uh, time, as well as benches. Thank you very much.
All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Justice Lokur. And I think the very important point which came through from his intervention was about the element of transparency and why certain cases were being allocated to certain judges, why is the system not being followed, what is the system, and what are the exceptions to the system. And I think we as the public, we as a public whose perception of the fairness, the neutrality, and the impartiality of the judiciary is so important to giving the judiciary the legitimacy and the powers to exercise, and the uh, legitimacy to exercise the powers that it has been given, I think that is something that we need to be aware of and we need to be uh, in on. I'd uh, next like to invite Justice Rekha Sharma, who's a former judge of the Delhi High Court. As a judge of the High Court, she delivered several landmark judgments related to environmental protection and illegal construction. Justice uh, Sharma has been outspoken in her critique, especially with respect to issues related to the judiciary. And those of you who regularly read Indian Express and other newspapers will have found her very thoughtful and very insightful interventions in this respect. So I'd like to invite you, ma'am, to come and speak. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. The learner speakers before me have given their perspective on the issue. I fully endorse that. And I have my own perspective and my own thoughts on the same. I have put them down, and I would like to read them out to you. First of all, I am thankful to the organizers for having provided me with this opportunity to be with you today. Though I am almost a stranger to the actual working of the roster system in the Supreme Court, let me share my own little experience of what I have heard and observed. The subject has taken me back to the year I enrolled myself as an advocate. That was the day my family looked at me with awe and amazement. It was because none of them, except my father, had ever seen a courtroom. My resolve to practice law was difficult for them to digest. Knowing none and with no brief, I would sit in some courtroom or the other, listen to the arguing counsel, and come back home briefless and with, this, and with empty pockets. But then, miracles do happen. It was a Friday. I saw an elderly lady lawyer getting up, bowing her head, and saying something. Two serious-looking judges raised their heads, looked at her, dismissed, said their lordships. The lady lawyer passed by my seat, red-faced, head jerking, murmuring something inaudible. While she lost her brief, it made my day. I was watching her great performance, and I followed her to her chamber and told her that I wanted to be her junior. And luckily, she took me as her junior. For a long time, I would carry her bulky files, follow her from one courtroom to another, and became immune to the epithets, good or bad, for the benches. However, one thing is clear to me. What was earlier being said in whispered tones in present times is being talked about openly. And it is something called bench fixing. Though with the passage of time, I became a busy lawyer, the bench and its allure became overwhelming 
I was selected for higher judicial service and a few years later elevated to the bench. However, somewhere in the back of my mind, the epithet bench fixing kept haunting. And to my surprise and dismay, I realized that though in the high court, the registry's hands were clipped by the roster system, that system too was not free, free from rat smell. And that smell emanated principally from the pen of the Chief Justice, who was in charge of roster. None of the so-called service judges was ever assigned important constitutional matters, habeas corpus petitions, or petitions other involving questions of law. All such cases went, di went to judges directly elevated from the bar, as if the judges from the bar were paragon of knowledge. In Nasima Rao's bribery case, which revolved around the interpretation of Article 105 of the Constitution and involving not only the person who held the position of the Prime Minister, but other equally important persons, showed not only judge's indefatigable courage, but also his complete grasp over, a const over the Constitution and its interpretation. But what is important in the present context is that the author of the judge was, uh, author of the judgment was a service judge. Make no mistake, the case was not assigned to him. It landed before him because he happened to be sitting on a criminal roster. And the question with regard to interpretation of Article 105 of the Constitution arose out of that case. And what is the present state of affairs, particularly in Supreme Court? It has taken the Supreme Court more than five years to decide electoral bond petitions involving the very existence and fairness of the election process. Chief justices came and chief justices went away, each shying away from taking up the issue head on. To be fair, to the then Chief Justice of India, even in the height of emergency, when Shri Indira Gandhi was reigning supreme, he did not shy away from constituting a bench and taking up the matter of ADM Jabalpur. It is a different matter that its outcome was highly damning to the fundamental rights of the citizen, and it remains an ugly spot on the fair face of the judiciary. One may ask why no urgency was felt or realized by one Chief Justice after the other in the electoral bond cases or other similar matters involving the rights of the citizens. In the interregnum, much water has already flown under the bridge. One general election and many elections to the state legislatures had already taken place in the meanwhile. And imagine when a judgment like in the electoral bond matters comes protecting the rights of the citizens, they are not only pleasantly surprised, but feel so relieved as to hail and thank the Supreme Court, even when it has only performed its constitutional duty. And when it does that, it neither needs applause nor brick beds. But the fact that such was the reaction shows how much the Supreme Court has lost in terms of credibility in the field of justice delivery system. The Supreme Court is no longer taken as the last word on any such pronouncement. It is already being talked that the government may move the Supreme Court for review or the State Bank of India and the Election Commission may ask for further time to carry out its directions, or the government may even bring an ordinance to nullify the effect of the judgment. After all, 
the government did bring an ordinance to reverse the judgment of the Supreme Court in the matter of selection of election commission by removing the Chief Justice of India as being part of such elect selection. Why have things come to such a pass? The government is not entirely to be blamed. Somewhere down the line, the Supreme Court allowed its authority to dilute. Though it is unfortunate, keeping in view the past performance of the Supreme Court, one feels it is the government which still will have the last laugh. Let me take you to the past. The aggrieved per citizen was known by the name of Menaka Gandhi. Our Supreme Court said, and I quote, that speedy trial is dynamic and progressive program of legal assistance, an essential ingredient of the right to life and liberty, and flows directly from Article 21 of the Constitution. These are brave words but lost somewhere in the wilderness of the roaster regime. You do not live on words alone. They need a heart and a heart that flutters. Thousands and thousands are rotting in jails, standing in the corridors of courts of justice, day in and day out, with prayers on their lips, hoping for the rule, bail not jail, to resurrect. But it surfaces only for the chosen few. Sadiqi Kappan, a journalist who was arrested on October 5, 20, got bail after more than two years. When he approached the Supreme Court under Article 32 of the Constitution, the then Chief Justice of India remarked that we want to discourage Article 21. Article 21. More recently, the Supreme Court declined to hear an Article 32 petition involving the arrest of Chief Minister of a state who alleged that he was arrested on no evidence and with the sole aim of destabilizing his duly elected government. The bench observed, why have you come directly here? The observation was made notwithstanding the fact that many a times in the past Supreme Court has been entertaining Article 32 petitions depending upon the urgency and gravity of the matter. And more importantly, the observation has come notwithstanding the golden words of B.R. Ambedkar, the architect of the Constitution, describing Article 32 as the heart and soul of the Constitution. Is Article 32 be treated as a dead letter? Remember the landmark judgment of the Supreme Court in Hussain Ara Khatun versus State of Bihar. Recollect what the judges said. Let me remind you. They not only felt that there was shocking state of affairs so far as the administration of, of law and order is concerned, but also that the legal system has lost its credibility. Arun Shori has beautifully described the present state of judiciary in his remarkably readable book, The Commission for Lost Causes. He calls the judges as lions without roar and lions, lions without throne. The misfortune is that many of them have not only lost their teeth, but have also lost their road too leaving the ordinary citizen to the mercy of predators and jackals. What we find today is that while a powerful person gets bail on an experimental basis, men like Umar Khaled are withering away, unwept, unsung, and unheard, and so fed up that coming out of the corridors of the Supreme Court is itself considered a relief. While a journalist spends time in jail for the crime of performing his duty, an old and ailing man, unable to even sip water, is denied basic medical aid and is made to suffer and die behind the bars. What has happened to Article 21? 
why those fearing by the constitution have forgotten cases like hosnaira m h hoxsort sunil batra and a k roy what has happened to those brave words in ratan singh for state of punjab where the supreme court said if freedom and liberty are to have any meaning in our democratic setup it is essential that at least these safeguards are not denied is our judiciary putting down who deserve to be pushed down and putting up who deserve to be pulled up or is it just becoming gilded pawn gilded tom of a failed talent the question is not who is making them dance the question is who is dancing and why while i was penning these lines i had before me two headlines in the indian express without a comment i am reading them out to you leaving it to you to react here is the first one a bench of justice b r gavai and sandeep mehta observed where the question of liberty of a person is involved even a day's delay counts and here is the second 24 years after a man dies in police custody ex cop sentenced to 10 years jail how do you reconcile the two one decries even days delay and the other tells us of delay of 24 years remember those five judges of the press conference fame one of them a friend from days of our mutual struggle at the bar is present today what happened thereafter any reform any improvement let us remember that a driver's competence is not established by his dress or his religious fervor made public but by making his passengers reach their destination safely a judge must fall in love with the constitution before he approaches it the original is beautiful its reach is not limited it is not a roster it is the judge who assigns the cases and it is the judge who decides the matters shakespeare in julius caesar writes his life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world this was a man are we today sure of the presence of such a man if not surely we need him though many today are seen taking a deep breath and agreeing with mir taki mir ibat dai ishq hai rota hai kya aage aage dekh hota hai kya having said all this i will be unfair to the roster system and to its master by not pointing at at least three pronounced advantages of the roster system and which fortunately or unfortunately have already become public and they are as follows number 1 the master of ro roster can constitute a bench of his own choice and himself preside over it even in a very personal matter number 2 by intelligently making use of that power he can assure himself even after his retirement a cozy job like a seat in the rajya sabha or governorship in sub state three by intelligently using his power he can equally benefit his very worthy and dearest colleagues too thank you so much thank you ma'am and i think what really came through very strongly uh, from your speech there was the idea that the supreme court has allowed its authority to ebb away that this isn't some sort of an external action which has weakened the supreme court but rather a failure internally to put in place the appropriate mechanisms systems and processes which have ensured that the courts public perception or the pu public perception of the courts functioning uh, is not called into question in any way 
Thank you, ma'am. We'll now move on to our next speaker, who is Ms. Meenakshi Arora, who is a senior advocate. Uh, she is a senior advocate designated by the Supreme Court. She has over 30 years of experience at the bar with very wide-ranging experience in election laws, constitutional law, and commercial laws. Uh, ma'am, over to you. Good morning. We are still before noon, so perhaps I can say good morning to my distinguished members here and all of you who have chosen to come here on a Saturday morning, taking your time out. I think it's a very, very serious times and issues that face us today. And if we have to remain democratic, it's very important that the independence of our judiciary also stays because it's only an independent judiciary that could save our democracy. So as Lord Hayward's axiom, that it's not enough that a justice is done, but it is also seen to be done. The perception of justice is as important as meeting out an actual justice. Judiciary derives its legitimacy from people's faith, which is reposed in its independence, fairness, impartiality, and thus any system that may affect these is likely to erode the public confidence. Now, if the survival of the very judiciary is on the basis of a public confidence, then it is, of course, necessary to send out that message that the judgment that is coming from the bench, it is not something which is preconceived, predetermined, or as my youngsters today tend to call it, and it bothers me immensely, is a match being fixed. You know, as Justice Rekha Sharma just said before me, and we all know about it, but every time that we hear it, it still raises not just our heckles, but I can feel the goosebumps. If in Omar Khalid, you withdrew the matter from the court saying that you are unlikely to get justice, what is a message that is being sent out from the Supreme Court? That's a loss of public confidence in an institution altogether. The institution is going to survive only to the extent there is a public confidence, and if there is no public confidence, the institution becomes a farce. I have this little thing in front of me, but you know, I, I will take some part of it, but I, the thing that's very closest to my heart today is, as one of my very bright young juniors once pointed out to me, and it struck to me really immensely, he says, you judge an institution's independence by seeing the number of cases that institution has decided in the matters of rights against the citizens, against the individuals, how many it has decided in favor of a state and how many in favor of the... I must say this, we were shocked to note that in the recent years, most of our issues which concerned our rights had been actually decided against us. We are lucky to have this recent couple ones of electoral is not going to come from this system or from this particular bench that's a death nail to that system and the institution. Secondly, the reason that I wanted to speak on the master of roster is, if the Supreme Court and our courts have to preserve themselves in the position that they occupy as a pillars of democracy, as protectors of our constitution, as our position against the might of an authoritarian state, they will have to end their act independently, impartiality, and not give out any message of prefixing of matches. I say this because if we look at our neighboring country, China, or you look at Russia, you go through a motion of a court knowing fully well that you have no position against a state and the result is predetermined. We know with Alex Navlani recently, we are not having it very far different in our home turf. There, it's an accepted fact worldwide 
that you are not going to get justice out of those systems. Are we wanting to call our courts the same? In the democracy, no, we do not. And therefore, the rot must stem now, before it's too late. I'm sorry if I sound very harsh, but it's an issue that I feel very closely. Coming down on the aspect of master of the roster. There's much that is said before me, and I'm not going to say any more on that aspect, because I think we all know that the roster system in its current form is not taking us anywhere. When our youngsters on the bar starts calling match fixing, I think it needs a lot of introspection. I would therefore rather talk on a positive thing as to what we must insist must be done to stem this rot. And for me, the first thing is that you do need a system, undoubtedly, how the matters are going to be listed. I have been in this court for quite close to 30 years. As Justice Lokur said before me, there was a system right from the 70s. The systems worked until, I would say, in the last 15, 16 years when it has become perceptible that lawyers would always want to go before a judge who will be inclined in a particular manner. For example, whether it was rent control or it was a labor. But there was a trust in the system that irrespective of my judge having a predisposition, an inclination towards one particular aspect of law, nevertheless, this judge will deliver the justice. So it's unfortunate that the second limb is eroding, but it is. Having said that, today, it is imperative that the court fixes the rosters and the benches transparently who will decide what category of cases. Now, we did a small exercise in my office yesterday to have a look at how the roster kind of works, and we found that the roster of work for fresh cases notified by our Chief Justice with effect from 2nd January 2024 shows that about 30 judges of the Supreme Court are assigned the roster for criminal matters. That's a ping pong. It can, it can go anywhere. That doesn't work really in the older system. So if we have, even if for six months, a roster hearing criminal cases, maybe you have a large number of criminal cases, you would have three courts, court number two, court number five, court number eight, be that, whatever, it doesn't matter, transparently declared, will hear criminal matters. That's an illustration, you can have it for the others. Within the criminal matters, one has categories, one has the death sentence, one has the economic offenses, one has the other. Please transparently declare which benches are likely to hear what category of cases. The ones you have declared that as a roster, the earmarking of cases must be completely through automation, and there must be no hand that comes in between that thereafter. No one at all. There is no need to fix a bench for a given category of case one morning, when you already have benches hearing a criminal matters, why should there be special benches for special people? The special people being high and mighty, or people who are inconvenient, or anyone for that matter. Because the justice has to be uniform, whether it's the mightiest in the country, or it's the lowest in the country. There cannot be a determination of benches for, for some category of people and another set of people enjoy a different set of benches. I don't think that sends out a message that justice is done as seen to be done. The second one is definitely hit. I will not make any comments on the first one there. Having said that, I don't want to bring the mic down, surely. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, having 
put this few issues that I have felt very strongly about, I just wanted here to say that so far as master of the roster is concerned and the power of the chief justice, you know, we have said a chief justice is one amongst the equals. Now, if the chief justice is one amongst the equal, the power that is as a master of a roster cannot and ought not to be used as any superior authority. And this power has to be exercised by him in a manner which is fair, just, and transparent. Now, if there is an apprehension that is being expressed silently, openly, but repeatedly, that where there is a predisposition of particular judges, and if the assignment of the cases happen to the judges which have a predisposition on particular thing, then the outcome of those matters is clearly predictable. So therefore, you have to take away this particular criticism that is prevailing wide on the bar, the perception which is from the bar is now transcending into the public space. And once it goes into the public, complete public domain, the complete autonomy, I would say the respect of the institution that it occupies today will be completely lost. The last part, as if I may add as my conclusion, in a democratic setup where anyone howsoever high is accountable for the acts done by him or her. The master of a roster today at a very high power level is unregulated and requires much more transparency, accountability for the acts which are being done by that high office. Also, there is no grievance redressal mechanism against a doubtful working of a master of the roster system. The office of this master of roster is sometimes inclined more towards the rule of a man than towards the rule of law. The discretion that we repose in an individual is always antithetical to the rule of law. We are reposing this power with just one individual to which there is no check and balance as of today. So either the civil society carries out an action that comes out with the regulatory mechanism and presents it to the court so that this huge power is not reposed in one individual or on the other hand, insist on the transparency on allocation of benches, have it disclosed on your website have with complete disclosure and thereafter there can be no changes irrespective of whoever approaches the court. I think with that, I will end my talk today and leave you with my thoughts here. Thank you so much for being so here. Thank you, ma'am, for those very incisive and precise thoughts on the way in which the master of the roster system should be uh, changed in the future and how it should actually work. I think what was a very important takeaway for me was that the independence of the institution is really something that is at stake here. We are not just talking about making the lives of lawyers or individual litigants easier. We are talking about something that is more fundamental to not just the Supreme Court but also our democracy. So in that way, I thank you so much for making that link. Uh, just before we move on to the next speaker, I know we had mentioned that uh, Justice A.P. Shah and Justice Govind Mathur would also be speaking. But unfortunately, due to certain medical issues, they were unable to uh, make it to Delhi. Uh, but they do send their best wishes and, our, and their regards for this uh, event. And of course, we are grateful for their support, as always, uh, to CJR and its work. Uh, I'd ne next like to invite Ms. Uh, Kamini Jaiswal, who's a practicing advocate at the Supreme Court of India and the Delhi High Court. She's a secretary and the founding member of the Center for Public Interest Litigation and a mentor to us at, uh, the, uh, the, uh, at the CJAR. 
she has also uh, been a constant support and her presence representing petitions on various causes and groups of people and she has always been at the forefront of many litigations and many uh, public causes which have reached the court and has taken them to completion ma'am i'd like to welcome you to the stage for the friends welcome to this seminar being the last speaker i think most of the things have been covered but i can what i can talk about is more about my experiences i think i have a very long experience as an iur in this court so what you know the historical changes that have taken place over the years and it makes me very sad today to even be a part of a seminar where we are deciding seminar where we are discussing some landmark judgment of the supreme court or some law that is being we are today discussing a very basic issue and which is listing and fixing which really saddens me where we have come to and what we were i remember the good old days in the early the 1980s when the supreme court we used to you know always there the congestion of board was always there because the judges were so few we just had five courts today we had 17 so therefore there it was a very uniform procedure you mentioned your cases and my matters you were given date depending on your explanation to the judges as to what were the urgency in the matter and let me tell you human rights and liberty were considered most urgent thereafter it was demolition of a house thereafter anything else so there was there was something there was some unwritten guidelines even when listing of matters came to it now this i don't think this has anything to do with independence of the judiciary the judici judiciary has its independence if it wants it now how much further independent does a judiciary have to be the judiciary will be as independent as it considers itself a person can have all the independence but if you decide not to exercise it you decide not to appreciate it and you decide to be subservient to the master there is nothing that can help you there is no reason today why they should be looking up looking up to the government or looking up to anybody for a post retirement benefit that is the most you know that is the most dangerous part of this system is the post retirement benefits that the judges are looking at and you find judges working very well till they reach the top when they are reaching near their retirement age you find a lot of them suddenly turning a new cover which is not really a very nice cover so therefore the question of listing and fixing on mm, constituting benches a very important factor in the functioning of the chief justice really must have set down guidelines the roster system is very clear the roster system works as per subject i don't think once the roster has been made that the chief justice should have any say in transferring matters from one roster one bench to the other there are a couple of benches with one roster supposing for some reason one member of a bench cannot hear a particular matter it can always go to the next bench it does not have to go back to the chief justice and in super sensitive matters where maybe it is of national importance or constitutional importance then obviously looking at the importance of the matter it is necessary that the decision cannot be left to one individual it has to be done by maybe if not five judges at least three senior most judges of the supreme court must sit together and decide what bench which bench is to hear it and like in the past if there was a constitution bench a five judges bench seven judges in a bench nine judges bench to hear a matter because of the importance of the issue 
And it was expected that once the law is laid down by these five, seven judges, it will be there for keeps for decades to come and it will not be disturbed. It was normally the five senior most or the seven senior most judges that constituted the bench. Today you find the Chief Justice picks and chooses judges that uh, will form a part, of, a part of the Constitution bench. It may be the junior of, you know, it's not that the junior most is not that intelligent. It's only the question is, they're all equal and we believe they're all equal having made it to the Supreme Court. But there, it was a matter of unwritten practice. It was a convention that constitution benches discussing important issues would be, the bench would be constituted by the senior most judges. And nobody, nobody ever talked about it in the corridors. We never had these kind of discussions in the corridors as this matter is being listed before so and so, that matter is to be listed before so and so and therefore this is to happen and that is to be happened. It's all right, it was there, you know, if a matter went to a particular uh, bench, we all knew that he was very pro-labor uh, pro or pro-tenant and the, it was likely that the tenant would get an advantage. But you still were quite confident that you would get justice. There were, I remember cases and cases, there were cases, I, since I did a lot of these detention matters, there were cases of people who were, these, these were smugglers, they were detained under coffee posa, and uh, matters going before a very strict left-oriented judge. You know, but you had, you, he would always say, he said, you know, I know your client is a crook, I know your client deserves to be inside, but the law is in your favor. I can't help. And openly the judges would say it from the bench. One would, you know, you would know that you would get justice. You would know that it would not depend, you know. Today it is, if, uh, I mean, Umar Khalid is repeated so many times today that I don't want to repeat it. But look at what happened in Ritu Chhabaria. We're talking of liberty. What happened in Ritu Chhabaria's matter? Ultimately, it was a statutory right of bail that was granted by one high court. And on the asking of the government, the, uh, the matter is stayed. High courts are directed not to abide by that order, not to follow that order. And a larger bench is constituted only because they want to protect. Uh, they, here we are talking of liberty, protecting liberty. What is this? this statutory bail which is granted under the law? That judgment is stayed for the asking by the Chief Justice. Then the next question that, it is really unfortunate, you know, today that the way the law is being treated, the way the constitution is being looked at, you just can't be sure what will happen. Thirdly, I just wanted to say one thing more, is that we are talking so much about the press conference, but look at what happened to the leader of the press conference. The leader of the press conference was the very person who, con the same judge against whom the press conference was called, every matter thereafter which came before him was marked to the same judge. What happened in Indoor Development Authority? Why was that constitution with constitute? What's the point? You know, it also, everything you can have, everything in place, all law in place, but it will also depend, always depend on the man who mans the institution. So there were law, practice, nothing can help you unless you have good appointees. That's it. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think that was great perspective. And I also thank you for making this link to the appointments process that if we do not have individuals whom we can trust to do justice, not to deliver certain kind of orders in certain ways for certain people in certain contexts, but individuals who leave us lawyers. And lawyers know we are in the system, we see how it works, we see we understand what justice can look like in without individuals who can do justice any system that we put in place will not work effectively or efficiently our next speaker will be mr gautam bhatia who is an advocate and a legal writer 
Um, he has sent in a video message since he could not be with us here in person in uh, Delhi. Uh, so may I request you to please play the video message. Uh, if the lights could be turned off, yes, thank you. Sound is not very clear, I think. Light of the death belief for a state and so on. And thirdly, the Supreme Court is a generalist court. So unlike certain civil law countries, for example, where you have a Supreme Administrative Court, a Supreme Criminal Court, a Supreme Labor Court, in the Supreme Court of India, the judges are expected to deal with, with the entire gamut of legal issues. Now the question uh, then becomes, given these three features, how do you arrive at a neutral and efficient method of administration that adequately safeguards against too much individual variance? Uh, given that uh, in the ideal, the Supreme Court is meant to speak uh, in one voice. One proposal has been that case assignment or assign assignations should take place through a lottery method take the human element out of it, it becomes random. That is something of a solution, but it doesn't take care of issues like body locality and, and one does feel that replacing the possibility of bias with the certainty of chance is not an ideal solution, especially for a Supreme Court. So in that context, uh, here are a couple of propositions that I'd like to put before you. The first is that given that Supreme Court is a generalist court, and given its strength uh, in numbers, I think it makes sense to actually have various divisions uh, in the court. For example, if you look at Kenya, and you see at the high court, at the high court level, uh, there is the constitutional and human rights division, which shares constitutional challenges uh, across the board. So in our context, this could mean, for example, something like a permanent constitution bench that, again, just to move one possibility, there are others, could have the five senior law judges of the court. Uh, within the Supreme Court, then you criminal division or tax division in case of the ever changeable roster, uh, which is, is quite a uh, vague concept. Uh, and this could also allow for the growth and the evolution of a more consistent jurisprudence uh, over time. It could also mean specific subject matter expertise then becomes. Uh, one of the basis for appointments. So, you are trying to rationalize 
uh, and uh, make assistance uh, the jurisprudence across various areas in the context of the polynomial. Also, in this context, the other proposition is that the Supreme Court could, from time to time, put out a restatement of the law of volume as happens in the US, as we are not by the Supreme Court. Uh, now, the value of a restatement uh, is that it systematizes precedent and jurisprudence and provides a guide to both individuals and equally importantly to the foreign judges. Uh, about where the law stands in a particular case. And in our case, if it is issued by the Supreme Court itself, it will carry the imprimatur of, of the law, making it uh, uniquely ordained. I think this is particularly important in a context where high levels of judicial discretion mean that in high stakes cases, so much turns upon the proclivities of present judges, which in turn is what makes a assignment from Android. So you want to actually uh, develop the structure of the solution to what is uh, you know, a problem that's based on individual decisions. And I'm sure that over the course of this session, we'll hear more this presentation like that. So, uh, the point that I want to make with these broad remarks is that discretion is something that is central to education. And it's something we need to preserve. Because after all, we, we don't want to be judged by algorithms. Uh, we want to be judged by human beings. Uh, but there is a fine line between discretion and arbitrariness. And when we are talking structural or institutional solutions, we are asking ourselves how can we preserve discretion but minimize arbitrariness? And I hope that these remarks provide some food for thought towards the end by way of the beginning of the potential conversation. So thank you and thank you. Thank you, thank you, Roshan, for those broad remarks. I think what is the uh, most important takeaway I get is that uh, in putting in place certain rules and certain systems which guide discretion rather than taking it away entirely, which makes for a more robust and a more healthy judicial system that uh, enjoys uh, public confidence. I do recall that there was an attempt at creating a restatement of Indian law by the Supreme Court and about three volumes did come out, but I am not sure the project really took off after that. One hopes that there is uh, more in, uh, interest in pushing this forward. Uh, our uh, final speaker for the session uh, will be Mr. Prashant Bhushan, who is of course the convener of CJR and really needs no much more introduction if you are uh, here at the session. So, Prashant, thank you. Thank you, Alok. Uh, we decided to have this seminar, both uh, the two sessions, the session in the afternoon as well, when uh, we were really very, very disappointed with what was happening uh, in the judiciary, particularly in the Supreme Court. And uh, what was happening, uh, of course, was the uh, kind of judgments that were coming out, which were, which we felt were letting down uh, individual fundamental rights or democracy or the Constitution. And we felt that uh, at the heart of all this, was uh, the issue of uh, listing and allocation as well as uh, the court's attitude towards liberty. Recently, however, there, were a, there have been uh, two or three very good judgments which have again rekindled hope that the uh, Supreme Court is perhaps embarked on a correction of course I am referring to the electoral bonds judgment as well as the uh, Chandigarh mayor election, <coughs> Chandigarh mayor's election judgment. Uh, and we do hope that uh, this is indicative of a course correction by the Supreme Court, though as uh, Mr. Pratap Bhanu Mehta has written yesterday uh, in an op-ed article in the Indian Express, 
he said that uh, one swallow doesn't make a summer and I agree with that. He also said that uh, sometimes the court needs to preserve its legitimacy in order to be effective or in order to be heard or listened to and sometimes even the uh, state or the government needs to protect the legitimacy of the court and some such judgments are essential for protecting the legitimacy of the courts because the court is often embarked on a venture of legitimizing the arbitrary actions of the state. So therefore he says that there should be a word of caution uh, about these two recent judgments. Of course we should all hope and pray that this trend continues and that the court, this indicates a course correction by the court. Now on the subject of this session, uh, just one more thing before I move on to that. Recently, as you know, just after the electoral bond judgment, Mr. Nariman, four days before his passing away, he was fairly well actually, uh, he passed away quite suddenly, uh, <clears throat> though he was 95. He wrote a letter to me in the wake of the electoral bonds judgment congratulating me for that, but also saying that he hopes that the Supreme Court will correct course on the what he called the no bail provision in some of our recently enacted laws. He was referring obviously to UAPA and PMLA which have a rule of bail which is very different from the normal rule of bail which he obviously felt was inconsistent with article 21 rights and he hoped that the Supreme Court would do something about that. But uh, coming to the uh, subject at hand, you know, uh, when the four judges uh, had that press conference, four of the senior most judges of the Supreme Court, and expressed uh, the fear that the then Chief Justice being the master of roster was really misusing his power in a manner which portends very uh, uh, ominously for our democracy, uh, <clears throat> it was not merely uh, politically sensitive cases which were being assigned in a particular manner. We have uh, heard Justice Loker pointing out that a lot of cases were going to the number 12 judge who at that time was sitting in court number 12. Uh, he unfortunately also became kind of the man to go when cases involving, personally involving the then Chief Justices were also there. And unfortunately the then Chief Justices even sat, apart from having that particular judge, I can name him Justice Arun Mishra, sitting with them, he all, they also presided over those benches which dealt with their own cases where they were clearly involved. I am referring to the medical college's scam case in which the then Chief Justice not only sat in the bench that he constituted, but he also had Justice, Deepak, Justice uh, Arun Mishra sit with him. And then Justice Ranjan Gogoi in that sexual harassment case not only constituted a bench with him in his own case, which he called in the matter of great public importance involving the independence of the judiciary, but he also had that same judge, Justice Arun Mishra, also sitting along with him. And when the impeachment case of uh, the then Chief Justice came up, when uh, an impeachment motion was signed by the requisite number of MPs, and thereafter uh, the Vice President rejected the motion arbitrarily, and when that rejection was challenged in the Supreme Court, that same Chief Justice constituted a bench and that bench proceeded to reject that petition challenging. So that shows you how this power of master of roster can be abused uh, so arbitrarily and sometimes in their own cause. Uh, 
often uh, for the benefit of the uh, government or the state and sometimes in their own cause by various chief justices if they choose to do so. And it is for that reason that we filed, uh, my father filed this petition uh, saying that uh, there should be few changes in this whole system of master of roster as uh, Cheryl had pointed out, this issue of master of roster is not laid down in any law or even uh, is not laid down in any law. It is just a matter of convention that the Chief Justice is the master of roster and he decides uh, which bench should hear matters, when they should hear matters, etc. So in uh, Mr. Shanti Bhushan's petition, the prayer was that look, it's too dangerous to allow this power to be exercised by just one person, that is the Chief Justice, because as we were told by a couple of our uh, judges here, it's well known in at least the legal and judicial circles as to which judge would decide which case in which manner. For a lot of judges, it is well known that look, if this bail matter goes before so and so, he is not going to get bail. If this matter goes before so and so, well, this is what the outcome will be. And therefore, we felt that it's not really proper for this exercise of master of roster to be with just one judge. It should be with five senior judges of the Supreme Court. So that was just as they have laid down a collegium for appointment of judges, collegium of five senior judges, same way there should be a collegium for deciding the roster. Now that means what? So the roster should be decided by subject matter, which means this these benches will deal with bail matters, these benches will deal with uh, rent matters, these benches would deal with service matters, etc., subject-wise. Because if you again have only the Chief Justice deciding the roster, even that power can be misused because suppose there is a Chief Justice who at the instance of the government wants to deny bail to all these arbitrary arrests that we are seeing taking place. He can easily constitute a roster for bail which will be of judges who say jail, not bail. So therefore, this power of even deciding what the roster should be, which judges should deal with which cases, should not be with just one person. This should be decided by a collegium of five senior judges. That was the prayer in that petition. The second uh, thing was that if there are, say, three benches which have the roster for bail, then it should go randomly by the computer among those three benches. Sometimes, today, today actually the rule is, if there are three benches, then the first matter, first bail matter which comes up, which will go before the senior uh, judge among the three benches dealing with the roster, the senior bench among the three, the next case will go to the number two and the third case will go to number three and then the next case will again go to number one, then it will go to number two, then go to number three, this is the system. And there are a lot of lawyers I know or some lawyers in connivance with the registry, they know, the registry knows that this is the first matter, this will go to this particular bench. Then they know that the next bail matter which is registered will go to the next bench. And therefore, if they know or if they want that their matter to go before a particular bench, they just manage the registry so that their matter gets numbered as the second matter or the third matter depending on which bench they want to go to. So instead of that, it should be just randomly assigned by the computer to one of those uh, judges having that roster. So that was the prayer in that petition. Unfortunately, the court dismissed that petition. But even while dismissing the petition, the court held 
even that petition, you see, the bench was constituted by the then Chief Justice. Unfortunately, we have seen this phenomenon that when a judge is not the Chief Justice, he is very happy to have this power being exercised by the senior judges. As soon as he becomes the Chief Justice, we have found that they want to have the power exclusively with them. And we have seen this repeatedly happening, that before they become Chief Justice, they are happy to participate in a meeting which says, Ki, look, there should be a committee to deal with this, Chief Justice alone should not deal with this. But as soon as they become Chief Justice, they change their tune. We have seen this happening also. So, the good thing, good outcome of that, so that the then Chief Justice constituted the bench, the bench dismissed the case or dismissed the prayer for having a collegium to decide the roster, etc. But they said something important. They said that there are rules which have been framed and even the Chief Justice as master of roster cannot violate those rules. But we are seeing recently at any rate that several of those rules are being routinely and repeatedly violated in the matter of listing as well as assignment of benches. For example, one of the rules is that if a case has been heard by a particular bench, then the next time it will be listed before the senior judge who has heard that case. But we are seeing that this rule has also been violated in several cases, especially in some of these bail cases or liberty cases involving challenge to the constitutional validity of the bail provision in UAPA, etc. It was mentioned that 10 cases, all of which were listed before other senior judges of the Supreme Court came to be somehow listed before a very junior judge who is almost the junior most judge heading benches in the Supreme Court, whose view about liberty was well known to everybody. And all the ten petitions came to be withdrawn. And this Every petitioner said that, all right, we'll go back to the High Court. What does that indicate? Of course, it indicates that nobody, everybody knew what the outcome of that, those cases would be before that particular judge. And therefore, nobody had any confidence that liberty or bail would be granted in any of those cases. But it also shows how and this issue was raised, repeatedly raised, that look, it has been listed before this court in violation of the rules. And yet, the matter remained there, repeatedly remained there with, before that bench. And clearly, the violation of the rules continued, obviously, with the consent of the Chief Justice. And that's what Justice uh, Call, when he, just before he retired, when the matter involving the appointment of judges was listed before it was being heard by him, the issue was how could the government, how can the government not appoint judges who have been recommended by the collegium and just sit on those recommendations, even those recommendations which have been unanimously reiterated by the collegium. And he was prodding, he was trying to gently prod the government. Of course, even he was not willing to go to the length of hauling up the law secretary or the law minister for contempt, which it clearly was. <clears throat> but he was at least prodding. But then, on one particular day, when the matter was to be listed, just before Justice Call's retirement, the matter was not listed before him. It was removed. Not just, it was shown in the list, but removed from his list on the morning of the hearing. And the files were withdrawn. And we, when we pointed this out, he said that, well, 
the chief justice is surely aware of this meaning thereby that the chief justice had withdrawn that matter from his bench for some reason unknown to him or maybe known to him which he didn't want to say so um, so we we are seeing that even the rules are being violated and that, that, that there is another uh, thing which was mentioned constitution of constitution benches again there are no rules it's totally arbitrary so there should be rules even for constitution or there should be some roster even for constitution benches you can't have this arbitrary that for this particular case for hearing it in the constitution bench i will have this bench for this particular case i will have some other bench and those judges are arbitrarily chosen and then there is something called sensitive matter i mean it's amazing that it there is actually a rule I, we discovered that there is actually a rule which says that some sensitive matters will be taken by the registrar to the chief justice actually i saw that even earlier I, before i knew that there was even a rule which takes this in every case of mine my uh, clerk used to report that as soon as i file the case that registrar of filing runs with your file to the registrar and the registrar then takes the file to the chief justice because all your cases have been deemed to be sensitive matters and therefore in every case specific instructions had to be obtained from the chief justice as to where this case is going to be listed so this i mean i don't understand how can there be a rule which says court and court sensitive matters will be placed before the chief justice rule or no rule so therefore uh, it's it's very very unfortunate uh, <clears throat> now on the issue of uh, just the listing of cases you see one good thing that has happened is that by and large at least now cases which are filed and which get numbered where defects are clear do get listed within uh, 10 days or so but after the first listing after notice has been issued there is no uh, clear uh, rule or system by which you ensure that it does get listed after four suppose notice is issued returning returnable in four weeks sometimes those cases are not listed for years thereafter even though notice has been issued returnable in 4 weeks now what do you do thereafter now uh, sometimes if the senior judge has retired after issuing notice you don't know where to mention it it says that you have to mention it only before the chief justice if there is a clear quorum with the senior judge being there then yes you can mention it before that particular bench that look this case has not been listed it should be listed but otherwise you have to mention it before the chief justice and the chief justice is often sitting in a constitution bench and he hears no mentioning while he is sitting in a constitution bench so sometimes urgent matters fresh urgent matters just cannot be listed i mean i find this quite amazing that there are days several days sequentially when the chief justice is in a constitution bench and matters just can't be listed just can't be mentioned even for urgent listing and sometimes we are told ki all right there can only be listed mentioning which means that you file an application and thereafter that application for urgent listing is listed before the chief justice or before the bench and i have found that in many cases of ours where there was great urgency we submitted slips for urgent mentioning and the matter was not just listed for listed mentioning an oral mentioning is not allowed so therefore you just can't do anything about it you are just faced with a wall sometimes so there are certainly very very <coughs> uh, 
serious problems with the whole situation of uh, uh, listing as well as uh, with roster, with listing, allocation of benches, there are very, very serious problems. I am not saying that everything can be done, everything can be computerized and done by computers, but what you can certainly do is, you can have even better, more fine-grained rules for deciding priority for listing of matters. Today, it's largely arbitrary. See, you mention and it's arbitrary choice of that bench or the Chief Justice to decide whether to list it on a particular date or not to list it at all. There can certainly be much, I am not saying that everything can be taken care of by rules or by computer. There, there are certainly extraordinary circumstances which may require mentioning and therefore exercise of individual human discretion. But yes, that can be done and for that obviously either the uh, senior judge of the bench concerned which has heard the matter or the Chief Justice will have to decide whether it should be accorded out of turn priority or not. But that discretion also can be minimized. And then there is, see, we are seeing rules, etc., being violated, whether it's by the registry or whether it's by the Chief Justice, the rules of listing, the rules of uh, uh, allocation of benches, etc., the places where it is listed, they are being violated, and yet nobody is being held accountable. Nobody is being held accountable for all this, and it is high time that somebody is fine. And I am glad that some uh, judges uh, have, have taken up the cudgels to say, to call up uh, and haul up the registrar and ask for his explanation as to why this matter was not listed, despite the fact that my last judicial order says that it should be listed on such and such a date, and then also it's not listed. And therefore, somebody has to be held accountable. Anyway, we have heard a large number of very, very good ideas from very many eminent people and I am sure that uh, the powers that be will also hear what has been said and take, I, and I hope that they will take this on board and I hope that uh, this whole system of uh, listing as well as allocation is going to be improved and not remain as arbitrary at it, as it seems to have become. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prashant. I think that was a very detailed and insightful and very incisive intervention in this issue. Uh, we have about another 20 minutes to go before lunch, and I thought we could use this time to invite others to sort of speak. Uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Justice Anjana Prakash, former judge of the Patna High Court, a long-standing friend and well-wisher of CJR, and somebody who has lent her voice to a lot of public causes and issues. I would like to invite her to speak, uh, to give her thoughts on this matter. Ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. I am a hopeless lawyer and what do you say, a hopeless speaker, but not a hopeless person. So, I mean, like, I am really concerned with the kind of audience that we have. Apart from a few senior persons, I see that most of the audience is young. And I don't want to put despair into you that there is no hope from the judiciary. There is plenty of hope. Don't lose hope. And that's the byword, I would say, you know. So long as you're a lawyer, keep fighting. I'm sure, you know. Uh, I Actually, you know, what happens is that... Uh, we start, you know, to segregate uh, the judgments in terms of wins and losses. We should not do it like that. Actually, what we must adhere to is this, that whether the judgment was in accordance with the Constitution or not. That's the only thing. For example, right now, the electoral bonds uh, case is being much talked about. But when you look at it, could the judges have ruled otherwise? That's the law. That's what they're supposed to uphold. So what are we trying to celebrate? How is it a win? 
I mean, that's the most common thing that should have been done right at the outset. Why did it take 10 years? Now, that's the problem. That's the problem, you know, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, about the uh, predictability of cases, let me tell you from experience, which is pretty long now, that uh, we, I could predict, you know, which judge will dismiss my case, but I could never predict which judge will allow it. And whenever a client came to us and told us, you know, and asked us about our opinion, I would say that till such time as the judge has written, signed, don't trust anything. So you can never be sure about the positive outcome of a case, but you can be sure about the negative aspect of a case, knowing, you know, the judge's beliefs, etc. When there was, a, when there was a sensitive bail matter which was posted before a certain judge, some of the lawyers, you know, section and I don't, I, I, either way I'm not going to pass a judgment on it, but some of the lawyers said that it was bench fixing. Whereas the judge herself, she said that people are trying to bench, hunt the bench. That they were doing bench hunting. So you see, this is the opinion, how divided it can be, completely diametrically opposite. So th truth does not have only one side. You have to see all aspects of it. Now where, you know, the bench fixing or whatever it is called is concerned, with the uh, things have happened if, uh, before also, it's not like this, that the things were absolutely hunky-dory and, you know, very glorious, you know, in, in past times. As a lawyer, I had to face the ire of the entire judiciary when I was defending a person who was accused in a case uh, of a murder of a Supreme Court judge's grandson. And I know, you know, what the odds were against me any time. Like Mr. Prashant Bhushan was saying, ki, it's a very sensitive case. You should have seen you know, the, the way the judiciary was, uh, you know, the judiciary was uh, behaving in that case in the Patna High Court. So things happen, things happen, but we came out victorious at the end of it. So at the, uh, what you have to see is, you know, that you have to diligently do what, what tells you, what law tells you to do, not cross the line. And that's the thing, you know, that you have to be careful about. Now where, uh, you know, uh, ben, uh, allocation of cases is concerned, things are much easier now with the computerization and programming, etc. Why can't there be a program, Mr. Bhushan, wherein the database of all the cases pending in the Supreme Court can be prepared under different heads? These are the constitutional bench matters, these are service matters, these are labor laws, etc., etc., etc. That can be done. And after that, make two or three benches of one particular subject. And whenever, there was a very wise Chief Justice who came to Patna High Court and uh, who, you know, who, who actually deprecated the habit or the, the, the tradition of every case being mentioned before the Chief Justice. He said, this is absurd. He said, and he made a rule that uh, different benches would be formed and the senior most judge would take a call whether or not that bench has to be listed uh, immediately or whatever uh, has to be listed as and when. So, you know, you gave power to the other judges equally. You divided it. See, one thing, master of the roster is still there because the judge has made the more, uh, roster of the uh, different heads under which the judges are uh, uh, seeing their cases. So, the master of roster is still maintained. But what happens is that, you know, you share you share your uh, burden or you share your responsibilities with others who be chief justices of different high courts. So we can have a database. I'm told, you know, I was just asking uh, Indira whether there is, you know, anything on the uh, Supreme Court website. It only says, you know, pendency of cases, itna, 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 you know, this year's and many years, etc. But there's nothing like a subject-wise pendency of cases. So we can have, you know, a database of subject-wise cases and after that, let, you know, the judges all sit together in a full court and hold, you know, see how it can be solved. The pendency can be solved. They can, you know, constitute three benches or two benches. The judge, uh, the chief justice can do it. I don't, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to interfere in his, uh, you know, affairs or in his powers, etc. But that, I think, you know, it should be more inclusive. The chief justice should, you know, hold these meetings in a full court, uh, full court meetings and then discuss these problems. 
this is not for lawyers alone as uh, uh, justice kurian joseph uh, rightly pointed out that the, it's the chief justice of india it's not the chief justice of supreme court so we have to he has to remember that he being the chief justice of india he has to be inclusive when he has to take the entire full uh, uh, other judges also in in confidence and then you know we devise a way in which the problems can be solved now where the constitution benches are concerned i would i really liked i appreciated justice uh, oh, uh, lalit when he formed the constitution benches right from the you know the junior most judge after all the junior most judge is also very senior compared to you know the judicial hierarchy so why should he be left out and why should the chief justice be included in every uh, constitutional bench i don't know there could be a rule you know that uh, uh, this is the database we have 20 cases now out of the 20 cases the five cases would be heard by the chief justice by the uh, the court holding position number number 3579 so it's all automatic it you know nobody chooses who five is who seven is who nine is so what happens is that there is complete transparency at the same time it goes on an auto mode nobody has you know an input on that maybe the uh, next five cases can be done, done by the second person second person plus you know a, a four six eight and ten and so on and so forth you can have you know five constitution benches formulated for every day let them sit after lunch we have you know in supreme court uh, uh, it's an advantage that you have uh, mondays and fridays for miscellaneous matters and the rest of the them uh, rest, uh, rest of the days are for hearing matters so you hear you know hearing matters on tuesday wednesday thursday whereas the constitution benches uh, function post lunch every day according to this roster nobody will have a grievance on this i would think this is the only thing that i want to say thank you thank you so much ma'am and uh, i really appreciate your suggestions on our, on how this can be addressed <coughs> and this is not just a supreme court problem but it is in fact a larger national judicial problem we <laughs> every high court has to uh, which have that yeah that's right Uh, so we have about 10 minutes before we break for lunch and uh, i think we can use this opportunity uh, to have a few questions from the audience uh, i would request you three things number one please identify yourself please make it a question not so much as a comment and uh, please raise your hand so that the mic can come to you uh, so shall we have someone with mics in the background uh, i think we'll start from the front and go towards the back uh, the gentleman here Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. We'll start. No, we'll start. Let's start here, and then we'll go. Uh, I'll just collect the questions and then direct the. Uh, yeah. Very good. Good afternoon to our. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. Myself, Rahul Magan. My simple submission is that today we spoke enough about the master roster and all these things. Now my question is related, relatively on the other side of the table. Mm -hmm. which is when we make laws and without quoting any story that i am part of one of the committee who was asked to make laws mm. when we make laws we make the laws who are highly superficial in nature okay and it take years and years and years and years amendment after amendment mm. and it creates issue which is called precedent issue right. every high court will see xyz from a different angle example Yeah, sorry. Could you just keep the question short? There Very are a couple short. of them. Yeah. Four, four laws: uh. PMLA, UPA, mm. insolvency, bankruptcy, FEMA, and IBC. Mm. There are enough superficial issues about that. Now, yeah. my question is: when it comes to judicial accountability, mm. isn't the role of the Supreme Court and, of course, the Honorable High Courts also to see mm. that first the legislator making the superficial laws, okay, and then the whole burden is on us to okay. refine, refine, and refine for decades. got it thank you so much uh, we had a question right at the back uh, i think there was a lady at the back who had a question can you just uh, yeah i'll just we'll request you to be brief with the question yes. before asking question 
<coughs> I would like to introduce myself. I'm a former software engineer, HR consultant, and social activist. <coughs> I am now 67 years. I am now presently the founder president of PMG India, People's Movement for Good Governance India. And this, my question is, <coughs> now the four pillars of governance, people are almost losing faith in the judiciary system. And the press, that is also one of the important pillars that is not uh, taking the news of what is happening among the public. Yesterday, I happened to go to the farmers' protest venue. I attended, I went to the Patiala, I went to Patiala and I returned back. And with me, uh, my friend, who is also a farmer leader, women's leader from Amritsar, <coughs> I asked the people, now, farmers are making a protest in one line for their MSP requirement. And there are a lot of public uh, furor against EVM. Because I participated the day before yesterday. Ma'am, could you just the Yeah, question, I am please. now coming to the question, please. <clears throat> I asked the farmers whether this protest can be together as EVM. Now, we have also written a letter we are now drafted and the letter is ready for the Supreme Court. Whether any so much of petition can be taken on EVM. Oh. Because right. If that is possible. Because sure. already a case in KV Krishna. No, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you, ma'am. We yes. got that question. Yes. Uh, I think there was one question here in the front. We will take one more question and then I'll uh, ask the panelists to respond. Uh, this is regarding, my name is Sudhakar Reddy, advocate. Hmm. Regarding listing, hmm. I think everybody spoke about uh, what is happening in the front, uh, but back end, uh, you start listing, I think Madan Kumar Lokur knows when he was Chief Justice in Hyderabad High Court. Hmm. I practice here in uh, Hyderabad also. Yeah. Most of the registrar listings list a case one price, hmm. not to list premium price. Okay. This trade, hundreds of crores going on all over hmm. India including Supreme Court. So this needs to be addressed. Sure. Those registrars listing, they are subsequently becoming a high court judges. And they are coming to Supreme Court also, one day. So uh, God has to save these yeah. constitutional courts. Thank, thank you so much. That's this literally good. hundreds of courts business. Yeah. Uh, list we, a we case, that, not right. list a case. No, we got that. Sir. Thank you. Uh, there's one question right at the back. Uh, I think if we can... Sorry, I'm making you run a little bit up and down, but we just uh, want to make sure we get as many different ways. Yeah. Hello, my name is Ishit Patel. I, oops, I had a very simple question. A little louder, please. Uh, I had a very simple question. Um, so because we're talking so much about the listing process and yeah. whether it go in, in what way we can, autom or we can make it automatic or what response we can bring, I think is, the, is one of the issues, or one of the core issues or the root issue not that uh, not only that the cases are being listed arbitrarily, but also that there are people who are being elevated to such positions who do not hold the views that uh, are pro-civil liberty or are in, con in cons consonance with what we think of as constitutionally. No, got it, got it. Thank you so much. So I'll very briefly summarize the questions and I'll ask the panelists to respond. Uh, I think we're out of time because I'll, we'll take, anyway, we can hang around. And, so the first, I think, related to the quality of the laws. The second related to the EVM Suomoto petition. Uh, the third was on the problem of what seems to be corruption within the registry. And the fourth also on the appointment of judges with certain kinds of views. So if any of the panelists sort of want to add their remarks to this, we have about five minutes before we break for lunch. If you could please use the desk mic if you'd like. You know, on the... Issue of uh, the quality of the laws, right? Uh, I think figures have come out in the recent past about uh, the fact that a large number of laws in the past were being sent to select committees for, uh, you know, to, to see whether they're in consonance with the Constitution and whether they should at all be enacted. That is one. The second uh, figures that have come out is the time that it takes to debate the laws, debate and discuss the laws in parliament. What has happened in the recent past, in this uh, recent Lok Sabha, 
is that the number of laws that have been sent to the select committees has gone down drastically. Okay, and the second thing that has happened is that uh, the discussion on the laws is almost non-existent. Maybe in five minutes, maybe in ten minutes, laws are passed. So the result of that is that the quality of the legislation suffers. And if the quality of the legislation suffers, there is uh, a huge burden on the court. And I think uh, one of the chief justices did mention that uh, you know there, there is a problem with the uh, framing of the laws uh, that needs to be uh, debated and discussed. Uh, I think in Parliament, uh, and perhaps that that that's the only answer that uh, can be given to your question. Uh, even there is a lady there who was saying, why can't the Supreme Court take up the EVM issue Suomoto? There is already an EVM case pending. Unfortunately, that also is being adjourned, 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 and virtually has been made virtually infructuous. So I don't think that they are going to take up a Suomoto case when there is an actual case already pending. Uh, any any other thoughts from our panelists before we close the session? Uh, there was one question on corruption and the other question was on appointments. Yeah, yeah, corruption in the registry, Hyderabad, <laughs> you had mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know, frankly, uh, you know, you may be right. But I think if, if there is corruption in the registry, it should be brought to the notice of the people, you know, in the uh, uh, in the court, the judges. They should be told about it. The chief justice should be told that, listen, there is corruption in the registry. But I can tell you about one instance uh, in the Supreme Court that was, I think, about maybe 10 or 15 years ago, where a person, uh, a non-resident Indian, his wife died on the operating table. And he filed a case in the Consumer Forum about uh, medical negligence. And uh, he had come from the United States a couple of times to India to pursue the case. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he had come to India a couple of times to pursue the case, and uh, it wasn't getting listed. Ultimately, uh, he bribed two officers in the Supreme Court registry to have the case listed, and then complained to the CBI that uh, you know it was sort of a trap and uh, these two persons were convicted. Um, so, yeah, you, you may be right, uh, you know, but I, I think it should be brought to the notice of the Chief Justice. And any thoughts on the judges, the diversity of views of the judges, which was a question which kind of came right at the end? Yeah, that, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very tough question to ask and to answer. Uh, <clears throat> You see, on, on, on the issue of appointment of judges, uh, the government has been sitting on files for a long time. I think Prashant had also mentioned this. Uh, what do you do about it? You know, my view is that you could talk about opacity in the collegium, but there's equal amount of opacity within the government, if not more. Why are some, you know, appointments not being made? Why is it? that, uh, you know, files are being sent back and in spite of reiteration by the collegium, appointments are not being made. There was uh, recently, some time back, uh, I think last year, uh, about uh, a person who, against whom there was a huge hue and cry uh, about the appointment of that person. Now, what do you do in a situation like this? You know, and I wish... Uh, you know, the case had been taken up by uh, Justice Call, and he had perhaps, uh, hopefully, I mean, I, I, I would have liked him to have given the reasons instead of saying that the matter is left unsaid. Because this is crucial. The appointment process is crucial. And unless you know everything about the judge, the person should not be appointed. And there are obviously uh, some compromises that are being made. Um, and I don't know at whose end, whether it's at the end of the government or whether it's at the end of the uh, collegium. But the reverse is also true, that persons who deserve to be appointed are not being appointed. Some of them have withdrawn 
uh, their uh, consent. I know one particular person who is with us <laughs> today, but there are so many more who have also withdrawn their consent. Uh, so really it's a matter I think that the government should, uh, the Supreme Court should take it up with the government seriously. Thank you so much, sir, for that answer. And uh, please give a round of applause to all our panelists for what has been. I think a very informative and very incisive set of interventions on this very important topic. Uh, we will now be breaking for lunch. But before we go, I request you all to please assemble back here at 1.45 PM sharp. We will be starting the next session immediately uh, after that. Sorry, 1.45, 1.45 p.m. sharp. Uh, I request you all to please be back here because we have another fascinating and a very detailed session involving some very eminent speakers whom I'm sure you would all really benefit and you would all really enjoy listening to. Thank you so much for being with us in the uh, morning session. I look forward to seeing you all in the afternoon session as well.